Hi and welcome and thank you all for being with us this evening. My name is Alex Giannini and I'm one of the program managers at the Westport Library. Tonight we're beyond excited to welcome back some old friends and, and to introduce you all to some new ones. We've got an incredible panel lined up that includes some of the most important voices in horror fiction today in a year where horror fiction is thriving like no other time in the genre's history. But before we start the show, a couple of notes. First, we got some really great questions from you guys uh, for our authors via email um, before this, and uh, we will do our best to get to as many of those as possible after our moderated panel discussion. Um, next, while we look forward to seeing everyone again in person back at the library, we do have some really great online events coming up. I was going to read them. I'm not. Go to westportlibrary.org, check them out, um, and just want to get to tonight's main event. Everybody bear with me for a second because I got to do five intros. I'll go fast, but you guys forgive me for kind of doing some editing on your bios. Um, so tonight's panel. Paul Tremblay has won the Bram Stoker British Fantasy and Massachusetts Book Awards and is the author of a bunch of books that will scare the crap out of you and make you empathize with characters on a cellular level. The just released an incredibly prescient and downright incredible Survivor Song is out now and it's required reading. Also, Paul is exceedingly tall. Alma Katsu is the award-winning author of five novels that combined history with the supernatural. The Hunger was named one of NPR's favorite 100 horror stories and was nominated for a Stoker and a Locust Magazine Award for Best Horror Novel. The Deep, which is her most recent book, uh, released at the very start of the pandemic, and it's a reimagining of the sinking of the Titanic with a horror twist, and you should buy that one too. Jessica Guess is new to the library and we're thrilled to have her. She's a writer and English teacher and is the founder of the just incredible website, Black Girl's Guide to Horror, where she examines horror movies in terms of quality and intersectionality. Her debut novella, Surf Berserk, is available for purchase on Amazon. Uh, and you can get weekly content from Jessica by joining her Patreon at patreon.com slash Jessica Guess. Rachel Harrison was born and raised in the weird state of New Jersey. She received her bachelor's in writing for film and television from Emerson College. After graduating, she worked on TV game shows, in publishing, and for a big bank. She now lives in Rochester, New York with her husband and their cat, Overlord. Cat slash Overlord, not named Overlord. The Return is Rachel's first novel. It's a damn fine novel. It's one of my favorites of 2020, so check it out if you haven't. And finally, to moderate this awesome group, we have my friend, John Palisano. John is a Bram Stoker award-winning author in his own right, and he's the president of the Horror Writers Association. My favorite work of John's is The Excellent Ghost Heart. Uh, and John wants you to know this, he's also very, very evil, like super freaking evil. Uh, so please join me in welcoming John Palisano. Take it away, John. All right, hi everybody. Um, thanks for that intro, Alex. Uh, yeah, I am evil, yeah. Um, there was a running joke because uh, uh, there was a tweet the other day that said I was like the nicest guy ever. And I was like, oh my God, don't tell anybody that. <laughs> <laughs> Growing up, being nice was like, you know, grounds for a beating. <laughs> um, for those of you watching, we are waiting for Alma to join us again. Uh, apparently her computer froze, so she should be back hopefully any second with us. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, we, we were talking a little bit before. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is the pandemic and how everybody is doing in the pandemic at this point. And who wants to go first? <laughs> no, it's a big one. I, I'll go first. I think I'm like, I oscillate between being like, look, I made jam to like sitting in the dark, listening to Mad World on repeat, watching a candle burn to the wick. Like it, it just, <laughs> like it comes in waves. It's either I'm like, you know what? Okay, like I I'm gonna be okay. I'm gonna make the best of it and just being like in a complete like pit of despair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can definitely identify with that. Um, so in the beginning, I was like everyone else, you don't know what's going on. So, you know, I was just like, okay, you know, we'll just, well, those, this will just be a few months. And then like, as things slowly started to, ch or not even slowly, but as they started to change, like I, I started to, I don't know, I started to not be myself, like stopped watching horror movies for a little bit, like, because it was like, the horror of outside was already too much, so I couldn't do it. <laughs> so I was watching Superman for a long time, and um, Justice League, which 
I've never been a DC fan, but here I was. I don't know. <laughs> like, so there's that. But like the last month I started watching horror again, which I think is a good sign for me. Um, and reading horror again, so good. But um, I've, I too have been cooking and, and bake. I made homemade lo mein today because I, want, I wanted that. And it came out all right. <laughs> like, look on the bright side of things. Uh, I mean, my reaction is very similar to both, uh, especially like Jessica's at the beginning of it. Um, you know, when we first went into quarantine, it happened to coincide with my, my two week spring break from school. You know, so we were just like, we, we left like a day early and then like all of Massachusetts shut down. You know, Massachusetts early on was one of the hot spots. So, you know, super terrifying. You know, my sister, who's only, uh, you know, 11 months younger than me is a nurse at a big city hospital in Boston. So I mean, we all have people that we worry about. I was super worried about her. So, you know, it's funny, I got a question recently about, oh, you know, you horror writers, and, you know, you wrote this zombie pandemic novel. So you probably felt like you were in your element or you know what to do well, like in an apocalypse. I'm like, no, I found out what happened the first weeks of March. <laughs> like I couldn't, you know, I'd, I'd watched a little bit of the news, but basically I was on the couch sort of in the fetal position watching Mythbusters animal planet <laughs> you know i couldn't deal with anything else you know and it's weird sort of i don't want to say what you get used to but like sort of the peaks and valleys of like what, what rachel was talking about it's like it's hard, it's it's strange how all right this is what it is now this is how we have to reconfigure everything essentially um yeah so I, like i'm sure like everybody else those are the things you know we wrestled with all the same things i guess yeah hi hi alma hi <laughs> Perfect timing. We, we were just discussing how everybody's been handling living in the pandemic. How about you? Oh, well, it's been quite stressful for really stupid reasons. You know, when you consider what everybody's going through, so many people, you know, losing loved ones and being affected in many ways. Um, we've known people who've gotten sick. Luckily, don't know anyone who, who um, you know, passed away from it, luckily. But, um, uh, my book came out right as the pandemic was breaking. It came out on the 10th, I think it was, uh, something like that. God, it's only been a few months in my memories. <laughs> um, and I remember we went on, uh, I was going on tour and we were having like the last huddle with the publicist and the publisher and everything before I was going on tour, just, just as all this was breaking. And almost as an afterthought at the end of the conversation, I said, um, has anyone said anything about canceling the tour? Hmm. And there was this strange quiet and, and they were like, no, no one's said that at all. And no bookstores have requested. So I definitely felt like, and you shouldn't say anything about canceling the tour either. So I went out and uh, the second night I get a call and um, uh, Penguin Random House, my publisher, had made the corporate decision to pull all the authors back from tour. And so um, I did my, the event that night and the next day I'm in the airport and it was just the strangest feeling because the airports were, I mean, there were people in them, but they were like a third maybe of what the normal, you know, um, volume was. And everyone is just sort of tiptoeing around looking at each other and nobody really knows what to do. You know, it was just the strangest thing. And then coming home and of course everyone had already done the stockpile thing, but my husband hadn't, didn't know, you know, wasn't sure what he was supposed to do. So, you know, we're trying to do the, the uh, grocery store runs and everything. It was just bizarre, but um, I've been very hunkered down since then. The most strange thing is that we decided we were gonna move to a house that was still being built in another state. It, um, and COVID, you know, really disrupted supply lines. It's just been really crazy trying to build a house. And I'll shut up now because I'm really getting off topic. No, I think that's, you know, a lot of people were facing a lot of different challenges that they weren't um, expecting. Um, how about your writing time? H have you been able to write during this time? Has that Me? changed? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I haven't been able to write much fiction. I've been writing mostly nonfiction um, for, for my day gig. That doesn't seem affected at all. And um, normally if I go even a couple days without writing fiction, I start to get really worried. <laughs> I, 
I've, ex I've described it as being like being terribly, terribly constipated. Like you really want it to come back, right? And it's been weeks now. So yeah, I better start writing some fiction soon. Wow. How about everybody else? How's your writing been during this? Uh, I, I would say up and down, like, you know, certainly nothing in March. And then, you know, April, I sort of like self-imposed a deadline for like mid-May to try to write an outline for a new novel. You know, I'm sort of in like the, you know, I'm very happy to be in this position, but like, you know, it's one thing to get like, you know, I, I, you can get into your own head like, yeah, you know, writing is not important. But then like, I don't know, I was like, well, you know, you know, my editor and publicist work really hard. You know, they kind of like when I have, you know, write stuff and, you know, my agent doesn't make money unless, you know, I, you know, I write stuff and he, he had a baby due or his wife had a baby due in mid-May. So I'm like, oh, maybe I should try to get him something. <laughs> Cause he kept asking me, he's like, hey, I know you get this new idea. Um, and, and he's a good friend. Uh, he was, I'm, I was actually glad he was prodding me. I, I needed someone to be like, hey, you know, maybe you should try getting back to it. So. But like everything else, there's been hills and valleys and like it sort of started over in June, um, you know, with uh, the murder of George Floyd, like, you know, there was no writing getting done for those, you know, first few weeks of June, like everybody else was watching the news and going out with my daughter and to protest and stuff. And, you know, now again, it feels like it's a weird, slow, not, not back to normal, not that anything was ever normal, but it's just, you know, it's been a little bit like a roller coaster mm. production wise. For sure. Yeah, I would. Uh, I would also say that. I mean, I had a whole plan of like what my summer was. I mean, like everyone did, you know, what my summer was gonna look like. And I was like, I'm gonna write another novella, or maybe even like finish my novel, or or whatever. And you know, just waiting, as most teachers do, waiting for summer to come, right? Um, and then this happened, and. Um, I thought I kept thinking, well, okay, we'll have I'll have time to 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 do writing, and then it just would not come. And um, I I kept saying, okay, I'll give myself a week, and then I'll try again. And then I did that, and nothing. And I gave myself a week, and it's like it's it's really weird because I I'm not trying to I'm not going to be hard on myself because like all of this is something that's never happened before. So who knows how we're all reacting? But it is. It's just, it's, I've never had this before where like the ideas are there, the time is here, but my will to do anything and to like connect the dots and do the actual work of like, which I love, by the way, I love like sitting down and plotting something out, but the will to do it is, is just gone right now. I, I can do a short story, a very, very short story I can do. I did one like, uh, mid-June maybe and and it came out really well but other than that there's been I've been trying but nothing good so wow. yeah how about you Rachel I've been writing I have to I have to write every day or I can't like do anything else I'm super type a Virgo and I'll just torture myself if I don't write so I write every day if it's good is another story I don't know. And I'm trying not to care at this point and just kind of keep doing it. Um, Cause I just, I just went to, I just moved and transitioned to writing full time for the time I was going to get something else, but right now I'm not really looking. So I, there's a little bit of pressure there where I'm like, I don't have another job right now. So I have to be doing something. So I've been writing, but uh, I feel like I'm going to read it back at some point and just be like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we'll see but. and Alma you touched on the promotional aspects of what this pandemic has caused um, where are things now for you with the promotion with the deep I, I saw that you have the, the paperback is coming out um, there's some other things developing in that regard yeah well the paperback's coming out next year I mean I don't want to be a downer um, um, I, I don't know. I'm really hoping that for other people, they haven't had my experience. I'm really hoping that Paul, with his book just coming out recently, that, you know, the business is kind of rebounded. But it's it's been pretty tough for the deep. Um, 
especially when it came out, there was no appetite in the news for anything that wasn't about the pandemic. So like overnight, all of the press that was lined up just disappeared. And March was very difficult. You know, people didn't want to talk about anything but the pandemic. So, but by April, I found, and I'm sure this is your experience too, guys, um, you know, the bookstores kind of figured out what they were going to do in the new normal, right? So they were, they were selling books curbside. They were doing home deliveries and certainly really upping their online game. And they had figured out how to do, you know, online streaming events and authors were doing them by themselves. And that really took off. So I don't know about the rest of you, but I was super busy in April. <laughs> super, super busy. And then it seemed like the appetite for these online events kind of, you know, petered out a little bit. So, but I figured, you know, I, I was lucky to have gotten what I, I did get in March and, and April. So I kind of pulled back. So not too much, believe it or not, I'm more focused on the next book that comes out, which is actually completely different for me. It's a spy novel. And, um, and Hollywood has already come a knocking. So that's been real. I know, so flipping lucky. So, so that's what the last couple of weeks have been like. So it's given me something else to think about and not cry so much over the deep. Uh, Rachel, Rachel and Jessica, your books came out around that same time too. What was your experience and what is it like now? Um, so yeah, my book came out March 24th. Um, but it was my debut, so I don't really know any different. <laughs> um, hopefully, when my next book comes out, I'll be like, oh, this is a totally different experience, and it's cool to be at in-person events. Like, everyone's, like, healthy, and it's great. <laughs> I don't know. I'm hoping. But for me, like, I don't really know any different. Um, so it was disappointing, I think. Um, like when my launch event got canceled and um, like I bought M&Ms, like, you know how you can get like custom M&Ms. So I got like pink M&Ms that matched my cover and they said the return and I still haven't eaten them. I call them the M&Ms of hope because I think like I keep telling myself like one day I'll be able to share these M&Ms, even though it's been tempting being in quarantine with two huge bags of M&Ms, but they're the M&Ms of hope. So I cannot eat them yet. God, I, I don't know. Credit. We had specialty cookies made up. A friend of mine just launched her cookie business, right? <laughs> Hundreds of dollars of cookies. The event was canceled. Yeah. It's going to be at Politics and Pros. So she said, oh, freeze them. They'll keep for four months or something. So we froze them. But, but then when we moved, we decided we were going to take the refrigerator with us. And so we had to defrost the cookies. So I'm shoving them at all my neighbors, you know, these big slabs of sugar. I really, um, you have got a will of iron to not break into those M&Ms. They're the M&Ms of hope. I cannot eat them or there'll be no hope. <laughs> I hope that's the title of your next book, The M&Ms of Hope. <laughs> no one can eat them. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so my, my book came out uh, February 20th, so like right before this all happened. Um, and, you know, same, it's my first, you know, publication. Uh, and, but also I'm with an indie press, right? So like, a very indie. So like I was, I didn't have like a, come like a, a launch party or anything like that. Even though I, I had thought about trying to, to plan one, but I just didn't, I was too lazy and I was working. And so I was just like, no. Um, so that happened and I remember you know, having kind of uh, not very high expectations for how many uh, books would sell and stuff like that. And, you know, in the first quarter, like in f from February to April, it did a lot more than I thought. Um, but then because of everything that's been happening um, and because I think it's on Amazon mainly, there's been a huge leap um, from, from April until now. And I think it's all, well, it's because, you know, like the, the ease of it, it's because of like, you know, Twitter um, and like people, you know, and also I'm not ashamed to say like, especially in the beginning, I was like, hey, if you're stuck in quarantine, don't look at the horror outside, look at the horror in the book, you know, whatever, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, 
which some people actually said did help. Um, but there's that. And then also, you know, what's happened with George Floyd and the protests after that. And then of course, like how uh, public publishing was like all, all of a sudden trying to uh, look at people of color and look at black writers and things like that. And so like, I think that also um, upped a few of the sales. Um, and, you know, even people like reaching out for, for like things from me and, it's so crazy because like this is the first time that like anyone like people have been reaching out more but like I said before I'm so drained that I I have nothing and I'm like oh, I'm so sorry I hope you feel this way in a few months but I <laughs> right now I I have nothing for you <laughs> but but yeah wow and Paul it doesn't look like they started up any kind of promotion um as far as in person um hmm. Yeah, no, still, and I wouldn't do it either. Um, so yeah, no, it's it's all been online, you know. So it came out the seventh. What's it today? I don't know. We, time is such a weird thing. Yeah. So I mean, it's been online events, um, and you know, it got good coverage. You know, the, the weird part is a lot of books were pushed to July that weren't necessarily. So July, I feel like it's just been like, here's all these amazing books coming out in July. Yeah. Um, so. I, you know, these are things I can't control, and I, I, I don't know, having been doing it for a while, having had books that have not done well, and some books that have, it's, you can drive yourself crazy thinking about it, so I try not to. I mean, it's easier said than done, clearly, but uh, I don't know, I'm happy so far that, you know, the people who have read the book have really seemed to like it, so, I mean, that's the end of the, end of the day, it's sort of all you can hope for. Um, yeah, but no, I'm, I'm available for more promotion this month. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, well, you got some great reviews. You were in the New York Times and the Boston Globe and the Washington yeah. Post. No, I mean, that's all been great. I mean, absolutely. It's sort of, I don't know, the, you know, the power of being a big publisher and just to have been around. And also, you know, clearly the book sort of stumbled into having this weird um, quote unquote prescience to, to what's happening right now in terms of the story of the book. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things that I talk about in the book, you know, that I wrote from July 2018 to, to August of 2019. You know, there's talk of nurses not having enough PPE and, um, you know, there's sort of right wing conspiracy theories about this virus. And, um, you know, it wasn't hard for me to predict that if something like a virus, like in my book, were to occur, that given our jackass president and administration that the, the uh, the response wouldn't be good. <laughs> that wasn't hard to predict. I mean, if anything, I think I underestimated how shitty a job that they were going to do. Um, I mean, so I, I, I kind of figured, you know, for coverage wise, that would be sort of like the talking point for, for, you know, some reviewers, because it's like, oh my God, how did, how did he know? I didn't know. I just happened to write a book about a virus and use, I meant, uh, use my sister for a lot of research. Um, so I, I guess I would just briefly say that a lot of the medical stuff, it seems like weirdly now, even though I wrote the book a year ago, is, so I went to my sister for, you know, what would a local hospital's response be? And, and she really, she described in detail her, her brief and frightening um, experience with the 2014 Ebola outbreak. Oh, now, yeah. there weren't very many, you know, Ebola, people who suffer from Ebola in the United States, but there was a nurse in Texas, I believe, and somewhere else in her hospital had decided, well, if it happens in Boston, this is where they're going. And um, the first response our hospital sent to her was lacking, shall we say, lacking in both like promise of PPE. PPE. They said, oh, you're just going to double gown up to Ebola and duct tape your sleeves. Because, <laughs> um, you know, they knew they didn't have hazmat suits for everybody. Thankfully, the hospital came to their senses and said, we'll take volunteers. And thankfully, you know, there was no Ebola outbreak. But in a weird way, that was like a mini preview to what you know, she and so many other medical professionals are experiencing now. I mean, so all that stuff found its way into the book. Um, so again, that, that's been like a weird part for me too, is my sister is such a part of this book and to have it come out while she is going through, you know, what she went through, the, you know, the horribleness of it all. And, you know, she lives in fear of the second wave. Yeah. And, you know, Massachusetts is doing pretty well now. But so, I mean, it's been a, like every, you know, everybody's dealing with all sorts of weirdness, but you know, for the for Survivor Song in particular, that's been the you know the weird part in my head that I, I still I don't know how I feel about it. 
Yeah, and it does seem a lot of the, the coverage has centered around uh, the weird synergy, to use a 90s term, um, with, with, with your book and what's going on. Although there's definitely a lot of differences too in the story. Oh yeah, no, there definitely is. And I mean, I would hope for people to read the book, it's, you know, it really becomes about hopefully these two characters because the story really only takes place over four to six hours and it sort of really focuses on a friendship, which, you know, I'm happy to say, I feel like most people have read the book, we're like, oh, you know, we found the measure of hope and, you know, their relationship and stuff like that, so. Awesome. Um, and I, I want to definitely uh, switch gears and, and get a little deeper here. Um, uh, Jessica mentioned, and, and I definitely wanted to talk about the entire other flip side of what's going on in our culture right now, which is the Black Lives Matter movement. And I know that has affected everything in such a profound way. Um, how has it affected you all as artists and writers and just as people too? Uh, strangely enough, um, I, I obviously like what, what's been going on has been going on for a very long time in this country. Um, it's just that, that right now there's like a, a light shined on it um, and even though I know that it's just another thing that is added on to like the pandemic and the administration and like our, you know, our government and everything like that. But for me, it's almost been like a, a small little smidget of hope um, in this because, and that's why I was actually able to write in June um, because it, um, this time feels a little different than like Ferguson and like, you know, what happened with Trayvon Martin and what happened with uh, Mike Brown and like all, all of these other people who have lost their lives. And it's just like, it looks like more people are paying attention mm -hmm. and more people are getting involved. It's not just black people or black activists or, or whatever. It looks like everyone is at least seeing it. It's like, because of the pandemic, because of, you know, our, our clown show of an administration, like, it's like, you can't escape it. There's nothing to escape to. There's no sports. There's no, there's no Obama to comfort you, like, or anything like that. There is nothing but like, what's in your face. And um, I always felt like it, it would take a huge, huge thing for any of it for, for like how, how the country looks at race to change ever. And I never thought that thing was ever going to happen because I was like, if it didn't happen, like with Obama, well, it's never going to happen. <laughs> like, you know, um, but it looks like maybe now, <laughs> like maybe something will come of this and not just, you know, changing Aunt Jemima, like on the, on the pancake syrup bottle, but like maybe, maybe things will, like people are, are starting to pay attention and maybe something like real will happen. Um, so it's like, it's weird because I know, I, I feel like whenever I see these protests, I, I'm like, oh, be safe. Like there's still a pandemic going on and like all that. But it also, it gave me hope. It made me afraid. It made me a lot of things, but I wasn't just like stuck, like how I was with the, with, you know, when Corona first came, I wasn't like stuck anymore. I was just like feeling, I was like, okay, this feels like movement, you know, not just being still. So that's how I felt, feel. That's a great, you know, I mean, I think you, that was great insights and, you know, I really appreciate you sharing all that with us. You know, I'm um, half Asian, so it's, it's a different perspective for me. Asians, you know, get, get a, a walk on so many things, I guess. Um, and so I, I mean, it's, I agree. I, I'm hopeful that there's going to be real lasting change. I guess we'll have to see. And the same thing, just watching the protests in sort of shock. I mean, here are these people that are, you know, putting their, their health on the line, possibly their lives on the line to make a statement. And that made me very, very hopeful. You know, I live in the DC area I'm, until we moved out here to West Virginia. That's what I did. I was in the federal government for a long time. And, you know, it's really easy to get jaded, but that really did seem to be a different, you know, the tone and the, and, um, the import of everything was very different. It's sad to have to confront really what a terrible racist nation we are. This is going to maybe sound stupid, but, um, 
some of you guys know my background is in um, genocide and mass atrocities. So <laughs> a really cheerful topic. But so I spent like a decade watching other countries just, you know, these internal civil wars with one part of the population killing another. And, you know, we sat there and we measure things and we take notes and we make proclamations on why this is happening and what you can do to stop it. But I, I never thought that America was, was as bad as that, right? And this is really, and you may think, boy, what a naive woman. I knew there was racism. I mean, when I was a little kid, we got a little bit of it because I grew up in a very white, you know, old Yankee town. But this has really just been so eye-opening and just, you just hope and pray every day that, that it is gonna bring lasting change. I would only add, I mean, I, I, like, like most people, uh, you know, I've been, you know, reading and listening and, you know, and pledging to do all, you know, the help that I can. Um, it's just for my own little bubble slash life. It's been amazing just to see through the eyes of my 15 year old daughter, who's going to be 16 and, and Gen Z in general as an old, <laughs> I'm going to refer to myself as an old, um, and just the speed with which, I mean, we did see, you know, some change and, you know, hopefully it stays and continues, but like even something as, uh, you know, you referenced sports earlier, Jessica, like, you know, the Washington football team changing their name, uh, you know, and just some of the things that were voted through and passed like so quickly in June. And, you know, I was reminded of a historian who mentioned like, no one saw the Berlin Wall coming. Like when that got taken down, it just, there were all these different pressures that build up and it happens. And, and I'm hopeful, like everyone else has expressed their hope that it, it's this kind of moment too, that it, it has to change because there's, there's no other choice but to change. And I'll, I'll, oh, like a small thing, when uh, I was mentioned when the, the Trump Tulsa thing happened, you know, and like most of the olds, I found out about TikTok afterwards. And I'm reading about it. And then I go to my daughter, I'm like, hey, I know she's all over TikTok. She's like, did you know about that? She's like, oh, yeah. I'm like, why'd you tell me? She's like, oh, we can't, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, did you buy a ticket? She's like, no. I'm like, oh, you should have. <laughs> yeah, that was an amazing show of, of youth power there. <laughs> and Taylor Swift using her, her fan base to uh, motorize against that was just crazy. <laughs> uh, do you have anything to add with that topic, Rachel? Um, I just... I mean, it just has to be a commitment for everybody every day to, you know, educate yourself and to listen and to also like lift, lift up other voices because it's not really about like whatever I think doesn't <laughs> like really matter. I'm witnessing something that's way bigger than me and, you know, I'm, very heartened by the next generation and um i try and cling to the hope um because there's a lot a lot a lot of darkness <laughs> um but on the flip side of that like there is a lot to be hopeful about and we just have to keep it going it just can't i think the media has kind of stopped covering protests and um the conversation is kind of trying to be shifted. Um, so just to keep the conversation going and to hold people accountable and to hold yourself accountable. Um, I think that's important. Um, yeah, and I'll say that's the only thing that I have been like kind of disappointed about is just like the media, like, I mean, of course they would, but like just stopping the coverage when like it's still happening, but, but yeah, but yeah, like you said, just keep, keep, your ears to the ground, keep looking, keep listening, keep, you know, yeah. And one thing that I'm really hard at in, in the creative arts, um, generally speaking, they're ahead of the curve in a lot of ways. And I think in, in our genre in horror and in science fiction, um, there's a very concerted push um, in these regards. Have, have you all seen anything like change over the last few months in that regard? or anything you liked that you saw happened because of these movements? I mean, it's kind of hard to answer. I mean, it's because the pace at which publishing moves, 
you know, is pretty slow. So I, like, obviously, like at the result of, of, of some of the protests, I thought it was very positive. You know, some of the sort of the blackout days where, you know, you, you purchase works from black authors, et cetera. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I just think it's way too early to tell. I know we're all in sort of today's day and age, we're all used to sort of like the instant fix. But, you know, as, you know, Jessica and Rachel and Alma talked about, it needs to be consistent daily, um, every day action as opposed to, you know, being necessarily satisfied with something. So I don't know. I mean, I even like, I, I don't think our genre horror or science fiction, you know, should pat ourselves on the back too much. I mean, there's a long way to go, a lot of work to do. Um, you're, you're, yeah. you're absolutely right in that regard. And one of the things I've seen that has made me very happy are pushes from the inside to go out of your way to change the status quo. Mm -hmm. and to look for new voices and to champion new voices that haven't had these platforms before. And I just, I hope that that sticks and that's not just something that's a trend. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. one of my worries is like, yes, this is great. And people are making anthologies and they're saying, you know, we have to do this, that, and the other thing. But I just don't want it to become yesterday's news. It should become the new normal. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's my And, you know, I think as artists, uh, another question that I, that I had for you all, and, and this, is, this is a big one too, is for years there was the theory that as artists, we were just reflecting our world. And I don't know, I think in a lot of ways we have changed with social media and stuff. I think that the artists and the writers have become voices in and of themselves. Um, do you agree or, or disagree with, with that? Well, I do think that, you know, when you're lucky enough to, you know, have a platform, you're being published, you have the opportunity for people to read your words and hopefully think about what, what you're trying to convey. Um, I think you do have a chance to at least, um, you know, contribute and try to shape, shape a dialogue. Um, probably a little bit more with the, not the last book, but the book before, The Hunger which was about the Donner Party, but it was written during the, the 2016 presidential election. And so some of the sentiment of what was going on at that time could not help but seep into the writing. And it did mesh with really what was going on in society and what was going on particularly with the Donner Party. You know, it was, it, um, the party broke apart across class, right? So it was the rich people who ended up sort of being ostracized. There was, you know, um, controversy about freedom of religion at the time and the treatment of Native Americans and all that sort of thing. So it, it sort of reflected, it, I mean, what, what was going on was, it, you know, true to the history, but it was funny how much it meshed with the current history. And I was so heartened by how people, readers picked up on that that they like that duality and the fact that, you know, we can think about today in terms of, of you know, a historical event or something. So that really kind of opened my eyes a little bit. That was the first time I'd written something where I felt like, you know, the thing that I was trying to get across was actually being embraced and, and appreciated, not just, you know, for the story per se, but that the themes were, were really resonating with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll, I'll Kind of to add to that, I feel like a lot of times, um, I don't know, you're kind of writing and you almost, uh, depending on like whatever your background is or your, um, you know, your, your personality or, you know, your identity, I guess, it seeps into your writing in one way or another. And sometimes your identity, whether you want it to be or not, is a political one, right? So like, me being a black woman, whatever, like certain ideas that I have might be considered or just coming from a black woman, it's now all of a sudden political or it's like whatever, whether I want it to be or not. And um, I don't I don't know if before like it would have been analyzed or looked at or seen as much you know, or for at least for what it is, you know, like in, in Cirque Berserk, you know, I have a black female character in there and I have her in there, not just because I'm a black woman, but because 
you know, I was playing with some tropes that happen in slashers, you know, mm -hmm. and I have, she very specific, like explicitly, I remember I had her explicitly say something in there um, that talks about one of these tropes that, that you often see with black uh, female characters. And I feel like people will now not just look at that and be like, oh, she's too on the nose or she's, you know, heavy handed. I feel like they'll actually say, oh, this is a conversation that we should probably be having um, whenever we see this in, in media or in books or movies, TV shows or whatever. So I think now because of what's happening, um, there's more of a, people want to have more of a conversation, I guess, or people want to look at it more. So it's there for them, <laughs> you know, yeah. That's a great point. I, I think it's always been there. I mean, I think the act of writing is a political act. Um, right. I, I take my dog for long walks. I'm lucky that I don't live in a very congested neighborhood. Uh, and I listen to nonfiction audio when I take my dog for walks. Right now I'm listening to a, an audio book about um, writers during World War II and leading up to the Cold War. And it's actually really quite frightening about, you know, the rise of fascism and some of the parallels. And, um, and you know, all these writers really struggled with their political stances and even within the left being fractured. So, um, and even someone like George Orwell, like I, you know, I've read, I'm a, I've read stuff, whether or not you've read stuff, you're aware of it. It was just interesting to read about how, like a novel like his 1984, he felt like was being taken by the right to mean something that he didn't want it to mean. and it's just interesting, like how when he wrote that book, he had these certain ideas, and when it came out, it, it wasn't at the time it passed it by. It's just like all the stuff that he wrote about essentially happened. So all these different sides took what he was writing about and applying it to today. Um, so, like your original question, John, I don't, I don't think, I don't think the how or the the writing has changed. I mean, I, I think it's a political act. It's just that what we're living through, it's impossible to not read everything being published right now in a yeah. 2020 lens and it should be looked at in a 2020 lens. Yeah. yeah and I couldn't agree with you more that we still have quite a ways to go um, in, in, in changing and, and adapting to, to the world the way it really is um, and I think that's that's a good conversation to keep having and I think as, as writers one of the things that's really interesting is that even for writers who aren't publishing necessarily books about current events writers are becoming kind of celebrities in a way like online and everything you do and every way you act is kind of representing that. Do you think that's good or bad? Do you think that the work should just represent you or do you think it's good that writers are now like on Facebook and then if they say something terrible, we know, you know, we're not just trusting the art anymore. We are also uh, looking at the artist behind all of this work. Well, I think it's, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm always jumping in <laughs> first. <laughs> I mean, but I think it's, um, you have to be true to yourself, right? So we, I think we all know some writers who are very political in their social media and uh, God bless them, they're willing to joust with the trolls and the spam um, farms and other things that are going to come after them. Um, and and also readers who say, you know, I don't want it to be political. I just want to, you know, and so you also have to respect the writers who kind of, you know, who aren't going to go out there on a political limb. I personally can't because I'm a social media researcher now and you don't want to end up being part of this, of the, you know, population that you're studying. You can't show bias and that sort of thing. And it's very difficult because of course, you know, I'm a living, breathing person and I have strong political feelings. You can't not have strong political feelings in this day and age. But um, it, it just seems like it's a very personal thing. And, and I do, like I said, I, I admire the authors who feel that they have to go out there and they have to say something because it's, it's, a, it's a zoo out there. It's a jungle. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I kind of feel as though like it's, it's it's a it's a double edged sword because like there's there's good things because like even up to over the weekend like you know uh, someone was like exposed for like being very creepy person you know within the uh, horror writing community and you know you want to know these things because you don't want to be supporting like someone who's a predator or anything like that at the same time 
it is, uh, it is kind of, I don't know, it's, it's weird because it's like, it's almost like we put a pressure on ourselves now to like police ourselves and to censor ourselves and things like that because we don't want to like offend or like or say anything that that can be taken out of context um and I, I don't know I can't necessarily I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing I just I know that I, I like to know like if, if someone is is hurting other people so I can not support them but I also do believe that people should be free to to say what they want, but then of course, you know, whatever you say out there, you're gonna, you're, you, it's left up to people are free to, to say whatever back, you know, so I don't know, but I know for me, I, I tweet what I want, usually, <laughs> I mean, I used to curse a lot more, I believe, <laughs> I use a lot of other words and stuff, so I censor myself in that way, um, just because, like, if anyone ever wants to give me, like, endorsements or whatever, you know, you want to keep that clean or something. But but other than that, like, I'm, I still usually say what I want. Um, and, but yeah, yeah. I'll go last. I'm curious what, you know, Rachel, especially being your first novel that came out, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, I, I, I assume, like, your publisher was like, hey, you you know, you got to be on social media to help promote this book, and right? Twitter followers, and yeah. I, and it, it's difficult for me, and I think this is important to call out, like, I am very sensitive, and I have a lot of anxiety, um, and, like, mental health is really important, so you have to, and social media in general is very, very bad for your mental health overall, yeah. so I need, I've been kind of trying to find a, a balance where I feel okay. First and foremost, I need to be a good person in my day-to-day -day life and like try and be the best person I can be like outside of social media because I could be on social media and saying things that I think, you know, my readers want to hear, but be a dick in my <laughs> daily life. <laughs> I don't censor myself with cursing. Yeah. Um, so like I try to be a good human being and if I feel it's necessary to say something, because I want people to know where I stand. Yeah. Um, I don't want people to assume that like, you know, I have a red cat in the closet. Like I want it to be very clear where I stand, but that's part of me trying to be a good person in my daily life. But I also need to try and protect myself because it's difficult for me to put myself out there just from a mental health perspective and background. I, I have to be careful if I'm sharing things, you know, about my life or even just like trying to be myself online where I feel insecure and not confident. So I'm still trying to find that balance of who like Rachel Harrison, the author online is versus like who I am in my daily life. Um, and I, I hope I can get to a point where I feel comfortable, but right now it's kind of a mess where like some days I'm like, I need to take a social media break because I don't, like, I don't know who I am in my daily life or I'm not feeling good about how things are going right now that I, I don't want to be online, but then I don't want people to like not know who I am. So sometimes it just has to be enough that like, you know who you are and the people who are close to you know who you are and hopefully your readers have a general sense of who you are. And yeah, um, I do think it's important because like I, I want to support people who are good people. <laughs> I want to uplift good voices. Um, and I think this is an interesting question, especially with like the whole JK Rowling drama. I think oh, that's yeah. very interesting because that's like, ooh, like Harry Potter's already a thing. We've already consumed that. So it's just, it's, it's interesting. I don't know the answer. I'm just trying to navigate it myself. Um, but I think it's a very, very interesting question. Very, very like, current especially with i'm thinking of jk rowling yeah oh boy yeah i mean it's such a social media and the internet in general i mean it's such a i don't know we could spend weeks talking about it i don't know i certainly have no answers i mean just from like the purely writer side of things i mean so many writers so many of us you know we get into writing because we're probably not all that comfortable in social settings and we're probably most of us not extroverts and yet and, you know, you know, modern writing, like publishers expect you to be out there, expect you to be doing the social media thing and promote. And it, and it does, it messes with your head. I've had 
uh, I was going to say four, but three full-blown panic attacks, and they've all been writing-related. Um, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, why am I doing this if it makes me feel like this anxious or, or this way? But then on the flip side, it's like I've met so many wonderful people, you know, and obviously the highs are there, and it, it, social media sort of feeds that dopamine button in the back of your head. And, um, you know, at the same time, like, if you think about it, no writers in the history, uh, modern history of writing have had to deal with the amount of instant feedback mm. uh, that you get now. Um, it's just, so how can we possibly know what that does to us? I mean, I definitely know when I've been online too much, it affects my writing negatively. So I don't know, it's just, I have no answer. Those are just like my like rambling thoughts, the things I think about it every day. And I'm like, oh, God damn it, today I spent way too much time online. You know, I can feel it. I feel it changes my thought process but at the same time it's it's so necessary like it gives voice to the voiceless or it has given voice to the voiceless um you know i've written about this for like three books now but like my biggest fear is one of my biggest fears is what misinformation is doing to us and how the hell are we going to fix it um you know so you know i've written the last two novels the cabinet the end of the world and survivor song i mean that, that's both in there um yeah, so I don't know about social media. All I would say is like, if you're a writer and you feel like you need to take a break, listen to yourself and take a break. It's okay. That's great advice. And I think like Rachel said, you know, keep, keep the conversation going. I think that's the, the important thing. And, you know, we're all talking about it and expressing this. I think it helps. I know it's helping me to hear everybody else going through these similar emotional uh, roller coasters uh, with, with social media and, and the ever present media. Um, and, and like uh, the, the, the feedback that's coming so quickly with every little thing you do, you, you know, you put a release out or you have a short story and you've got all these, these replies so quickly to you and not always great. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. Um, I think we need to grab um, Alex and Cody because they had some questions and I know we're, we're uh, you're, end here. Oh. You're okay on time still. We, we got about 15 minutes. Uh, if you had more stuff, John, that you wanted to cover, you, you can, or, or we could jump into some audience questions. Well, my, my last question that I had written down was asking everybody if they had anything new coming out past what we already know about that they wanted to share. I can't talk about it yet. <laughs> that's still exciting <laughs> that's <Yeah. cheap. laughs> something you can't talk about that's good <laughs> we have short don't... stories online if you'd like to return or if you can't get your hands on it just yet they're on my website so. they're on my site my website yay so free free and easy <laughs> online Love it. Um, my publisher is re- well, my William Morrow is going to re-release two books that I did with a different publisher, my two weird crime novels. Oh. And those will be out in early 2021. And then if I finish this book that I started, that should be out in 2022. All right. <laughs> that feels kind of silly talking about what a year or two down the road, but I guess that's... No, it's so far away. Out. I don't have anything, <laughs> like, coming up. Uh, like I had said earlier, my next novel is a spy novel. It's called Red Widow. Um, you know, after 35 years in the intelligence business as a Fed, I'll leave you to fill in the three-letter acronyms there. You would have thought I would have been able to write a spy novel a lot earlier, but no. Um, so I'm really pleased with this one, uh, but that doesn't come out until spring of 2021. And I recently signed a contract for the next two historical horror novels with Putnam. And then I'm working on the next one is called The Fervor. And it has to do with the Japanese internment uh, during World War II. And it's a really funny thing. Now, so I'm Japanese American. My mom is from Japan, but my in-laws family were all interned. And so this is a very personal thing for me, but it's very weird too, right? Because it's fiction and it's a horror story. Let's bear that in mind. And their expectations are through the roof. <laughs> what am I going to write about? And so it's, it's, uh, it's a little difficult trying to sort of reconcile those two things. But, but um, it's interesting getting to put to use all this knowledge that uh, I've accumulated over the years from their stories and and um, all of the other stuff, the documentaries and stuff that I'd seen. 
Amazing. Did your old bosses have to vet your spy novel or anything? Or? Yes, they do. That is a wow. lifetime commitment. <laughs> wow, interesting. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it, it and actually I was I was kind of worried, even though I know you know the only thing they can get you for once you retire is a classified information. It cannot have classified information in it, and I knew there was no classified information in it. But the truth is, is it ends up being very political. It's like a lever of control, right, that they have over you. So I was kind of holding my breath and uh, went through without. They didn't ask for any changes. So wow, really you lucky. You had to send your manuscript for like review. I'm sorry? You had to send the manuscript in for a review? Yep. 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 Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have Trump's tax returns, do you? God, I wish. <laughs> God, I wish. <laughs> it's wild. I think so, we should take the audience questions. Right? Yeah, I'll jump in with a couple. We do we do have a few. So uh a couple of process questions. Um, do you guys uh utilize either writers groups or like critique groups? Uh, and does anyone use any particular writing software? I have some friends from uh, my MFA program that I stay, that I'm, I mean, we're just friends. So we still talk and we have like, you know, weekly um, Netflix watches now, but uh, they were my readers um, for Cirque Berserk. And I usually have them read anything that I write. Um, and we like give each other notes, basically almost kind of like a workshop sometimes, but um, they, mainly them. Um, uh, and there was a second part to that question, wasn't there? Oh, software. I, I don't know, I know people don't like Word, but I don't know. Word, yeah, Word. <laughs> yeah, Word. That's what I use. I am. <laughs> cool. Um, I guess I would just say really briefly, I use sure. Word as well. I don't use anything fancy. Um, I used to have a small writers group, mainly friends. We would meet like once a month. But at this point now, I just have like a, you know, a few like first readers that I use. But that writers group, especially at that point in my life when I was writing was super helpful. If nothing else, it was a commiserative, you know, people sort of in the same sort of struggle kind of feeling, which is, I mean, don't uh, underestimate that and how yeah. much that can help. Yeah, Anybody I mean, Scribner, Scribner. Scribner. No, you use Scribner? <laughs> no, 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 no. You know, one of the things about a writing group is it does teach you how to take criticism. You know, when you're first learning how to write, sometimes all any any you know disagreement with what you've written or your thought process or something, you know, just puts you on the defensive. But if you're gonna persist as a writer, you really have to learn to deal with other people's views and, and to figure out what parts you keep and what parts you don't pay attention to. And so having a critique group is, you know, is pretty, pretty useful for that. Unfortunately, my critique group, uh, there was four of us women who were all sort of at the same point in our writing career in DC. And we used to get together for a couple of years, but then our lives just really pulled us apart. And unfortunately I don't, and I'm sure my agent and my editors wish I had a critique group, but they end up being my critique uh, group now. Same. Yeah. For my, for my, I was in like a few workshop classes for my short stories, but um, for my novel, no, I think my agent was the first person to ever read my book. <laughs> wow. I got lucky because wow. she wasn't my agent when she read it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I kind of rolled the dice there. But so you don't need one, but if you can get one, yeah. and if you want one, I don't have one. <laughs> so that, that was actually another question. So uh, someone asked about the differences in, in your opinions between self-publishing, traditional publishing, and agent or non-agented. So I don't know if you want to pick up on that, Fred. We don't have to pick up on the thread. We'll go to another. I'm, I'm a, I'm a rookie, <laughs> so I'm interested to hear what what other. Well, so you said, so Rachel, you said you don't have an agent. I, I do have an agent. You do, okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't. I don't. You have don't. Any. Right. Um. So I mean, the basically, uh, the book has come out through an independent press and everything like that, and like, um, there there are really good parts to this and really not so good parts to this right so like the good parts are that like i had 
a say in like the cover like I basically told him exactly what I wanted and like he gave me exactly what I wanted <laughs> and like um I you know I I basically talked through a lot like a lot of steps and stuff like that and like I said before with like Amazon how like because of all this I think it did a little better than it would have and all that but also, you know, I basically have to market all by myself. Like he, he posts as well, but marketing is all on me, you know, um, editing, all that kind of stuff. Like it's, it's like two people basically having to work through all this and it's a little harder. And, um, because, you know, I, I, I'm really new to all this. I'm kind of like learning as I go. Um, like even doing, like finding book reviewers was like, one of the scariest parts of this whole thing for me was like having to reach out to people who are not just you know the person who was reading my book and like ask them to do all this and like so I guess I I would I don't know I I don't know the other side of it I don't know the stuff that I'm missing out on by like having an agent and having like or like having a book deal besides the money part obviously but like, like I don't know those parts that I'm missing out on this part is very exciting and I'm glad that I am doing it this way because like I don't know. I feel, I feel a little bit more in control of things that are happening, I suppose, because it's done this way. But, um, uh, yeah, I feel as though there's, there's more of a learning curve, I guess. Yeah. Um, I, I would say briefly, because I've, you know, I've published with small independent presses and, you know, I've published with big publishers too. And I don't know, I guess I've been <laughs> around or doing it for a while. Like I spent, two full years, two full years looking for an agent. So two full years meant like collecting over 200 rejections. Um, I don't know, I mean, I had the, the luxury of, uh, of, you know, I still have my high school teaching job. So I always felt like I'm gonna be patient. You know, I'm not, I'm not depending on my writing to support me. Like I had, I felt like I had the time. It was hard, I mean, I was frustrated, believe me. But, you know, to break into the bigger publishing, you had to have an agent. So I'm like, okay, I'm, I guess I'll get an agent. Um, I will say that my, my first novel that published with a big publisher, Henry Holt in 2009, um, you know, it was my first book with a big publisher. I was like, all right, this is it. And, you know, made it. And it's like, oh, oh, you still have to do like a lot of the stuff yourself. <laughs> oh, you mean I have to write the, the back copy, like the summary that goes on the back of the book. <laughs> oh, I have to do a lot of my own. Uh, I mean, now, I mean, that said, there obviously publicist helps and they get the books out to reviewers, which is the biggest thing, mm -hmm. or one of the biggest things I think that, you know, the advantage of a larger publisher. Um, but it's, but it's pressure. Like if your book doesn't sell, they're not going to want you back. My first two crime novels really did not sell well at all for a variety of reasons that weren't my fault. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and I, I spent two or three years just bitter, jealous, you know, inside, which is the word it's, that's the mind killer. You can't, you can't sustain yourself off that. Um, what was it? Someone said that jealousy is like drinking poison, expecting the other person to get sick. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it took me, you know, a lot of it was just like a, a blow to the, the writing ego too. And it took me three years to sort of snap myself out of it. And when I wrote a head full of ghosts, you know, my hope was, you know, I know that my prior sales record is going to be a hurdle. The hope was this is good enough, you know, that I'll get a second chance. And you know, my agent was up front with me. He was like, hey, this is great. You know, it's just your prior sales record is going to be something to, to get over. And I know there were a bunch of editors in interested, like, within the first month. And they all backed out because all their sales, all their sale, all the sales teams at the publisher said, ah, it's horror. And, you know, his sales record isn't good. Um, and that was, like, the lowest point in my writing life. But it only takes one. And my current editor read it, loved it, and believed in it. So, I don't know. It's just... It's so hard to be patient, especially now. I'm glad I'm not like a, a young new writer now because the pressure is to not be patient. Um, mm -hmm. And even though like it feels like the world is, is falling apart, <laughs> I, I, would, I would encourage you know, writers to be patient when you can. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, and Jessica, well, how you went about it, I think it's great. That's, I mean, that's my first things that weren't like novel length. I, I got a small independent publisher. I think that's a great way to like make a name and meet people and that adds up. Yeah. Um, I guess the last thing I would say is like, you know, just the very act of being persistent of sticking around is like the longer you can just like nudge people and be there is the more chance that luck and opportunity 
will be there because there's so many talented writers, right? I mean, I, I know I'm super lucky. Every writer that, that has published majorly has had some break somewhere. And that, I guess the thing that you can control is just trying to be stubbornly persistent enough to be around long enough that the odds work in your favor that you will, it's your turn for that, that little piece of luck that you need. That, that's very truthful. I mean, I think Paul and I have been around roughly the same amount of time. And, um, you know, every writer you look at that you think, wow, aren't they lucky, you know, overnight success or whatever. Everyone's career has these ups and downs. And hopefully if you, if you hang in there long enough, eventually you'll get that break. What I normally say, because again, you know, uh, uh, when I started out, self-publishing was just breaking. Amazon platform, all that was happening right around 2010, 2011. And so, um, you know, Paul and I went into what I think with, expecting a different path because that's the path that was there at the time and it's changed you know quite a bit now so generally what I tell people when I'm asked that question is I think it really depends on what your goals are and um, you know I, what Paul said is very true just be careful that you're not being impatient and and you're substituting that for what your real goal is I mean, if your goal is to try to break into one of the, t the big five publishers, the major publishing houses, give yourself a good, honest run at it. And it takes time. It's not going to, it's not going to happen in your first five submissions. <laughs> you know, it's going to, we all have had hundreds of rejections and, you know, feeling like the door's closed in your face. You just have to be persistent if that's what you want. But if that's not what you want, if you're the kind of person who really needs a lot of control, and I'm not saying that's you, Jessica, but when you said that, boy, I could feel that because I'm used to having a lot of control <laughs> and you don't in the publishing world. The best yeah. you can hope for is to have an, an honest partner in your publisher who's going to work, you know, with you fair and square. But, you know, there's always times when there's that imbalance of power and you have no control over what's happening. So there's a lot of factors, I think, in the equation. But the main thing is to really be honest with yourself. What is it that you want to get out of publishing? Because writing is very hard. It's very hard and the business is very difficult. So you should at least, you know, swing for the fences. Yeah. I, I think, unfortunately, got to probably put an end to it there because uh, I could listen to you guys all night. This was so great, everybody. Thank you all so much for, for being here. John, wonderful job moderating it all. And, and really, just thank you so much. We're so honored to have you guys here. Um, and for, for everybody watching, thank you for, for being here. Uh, stay tuned to westportlibrary.org because, spoiler alert, everyone on this call might be coming back for something super cool later in the year. Um, and just, just want to tell everybody after this, at, when, when this is done, um, everybody who registers is going to get an email from, from me and my colleague Cody uh, with some links to buy all of our awesome panelists' books at independent bookstores because we need to support indie shops. Nice. Uh, uh. Thanks. So, <laughs> I'm John, glad I wasn't the only stuff? one who was like. <laughs> <laughs> so again, to all you guys, thank you so much, Jessica, Rachel, John, Paul, Alma. You guys are the best. We love you. Thank you so much. And everybody watching, thank you. And, and everybody have a good evening and stay safe. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, John. Thanks. Thanks.